what is a virus anyway? Here's our definition that we have used for years. An infectious obligate intracellular parasite. We used to have small in there. And for reasons that I think will become obvious, that's, that's sort of redundant because the fact is viruses have to get into cells in order to multiply. So they would have to be small. So I've taken that out of the definition. I've taken the license of removing it from the definition. So infectious is clear to you. Uh, obligate, you have to do this. They have to go inside of cells. And they're parasites. A parasite is something that benefits at the expense of another organism. It's typically a different species. It doesn't have to harm it, but it benefits from its uh, interaction with that organism. All right, so that's the most basic definition you can have of viruses. Then to take it a little bit more, viruses package their genome in a particle of some kind, and that particle is needed to transmit the genome from host to host. The genome, the nucleic acid, we use genome to call, to call it what the nucleic acid is, contains information to initiate and complete an infectious cycle. So an infectious cycle is what goes on when the virus infects the cell. And we have, I believe the next lecture is called the infectious cycle. We're going to explore exactly what that is. But all of that is directed by the genetic information of the particle. And finally, uh, the genome of the virus is able to establish itself in a population so that it can endure. If it can't do this, the virus will be extinguished. And there are many examples of viruses that have been around and are now extinct. They haven't been able to, to establish themselves in a population. One of the things you will learn from this course is that virology or viruses are, are very dynamic. They come and go. And there, is, there isn't a tear shed over that. The viruses have no human features whatsoever. They exist only because they make a lot of themselves and natural selection takes over. And if a particular virus is extinguished, another one will be taking its place. So that is our definition of viruses. Now, already today before class, someone asked me about, are viruses alive? So this is a question that is hotly debated. And in fact, um, over a year ago, I put up a poll on my blog, are viruses alive? And the possibilities were yes, no, something in between, and I don't know. And we had almost 3,300 uh, 3, responses. And you can see they were evenly split. And these are people from all over the world, not just uh, students like yourselves, but people who are interested in viruses. Now, for some reason, this survey disappeared two weeks ago. SurveyMonkey decided that unless you pay, you can't have more than 100 responses to your survey, which is too bad because I had such a nice history there. So I made up a new survey on another site. And uh, we have a few hundred responses so far, and these are I made it slightly different. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, you can take this survey. You can take it now or maybe at the end of the course and see what you think. I think viruses are not living, but many people debate this. And when I say viruses are not living, I actually mean the virus particle. What are the attributes of life? You can reproduce, you can evolve, you can undergo metabolism. In my view, a virus particle can't do any of those. Okay, virus particles are inert chemicals. They're very nice chemicals, very complicated, but they do nothing. If I had a tube of viruses here, it would sit here without doing a thing forever. It would not evolve, it would not metabolize, it would not reproduce, unless I add a cell that the virus could get into and then do all of those things. So that, that's what I mean. I think many people, when we say our virus is alive, they have this idea of an infected cell. They say, well, of course a, a virus is alive because the infected cell is alive. And so, in fact, um, here is a better way to look at the question, are viruses alive? And this is actually an idea set forth by a evolutionary virologist whose work we'll come back to later. And what he proposes is that a virus is an organism with two phases. There's the virion, all right, that's the inert substance which composed of protein and nucleic acid, sometimes some lipid and carbohydrate. And then there's the infected cell. So distinguishing between the virus and the virion is very important for this definition. The virion is this infectious particle. 
The virus is this organism which has two phases, a virion and an infected cell. So I would totally agree that the infected cell is living. Of course it is, because the cell is living. It may be dead eventually, but the virus will get out of it, and then you will have the virion. The virion is clearly uh, not infectious. Now you can, you can approximate this to a spore or a seed, which can sit on a surface forever and never have any of the properties of life. But of course, once you add nutrients, that they, then they become living. So in a way, the virion is like that. The virion is non-living, but once it gets into an infected cell, it becomes living. So this is my view. There's no answer to this, and you may have your own, and, and that's fine. But I think it's interesting to think about, because it makes you refine um, what's living and what's not living. Now, because viruses are parasites, they're obligate intracellular parasites. have to get into a cell in order to multiply. To make more viruses, the virus has to get inside a cell. If it doesn't get inside the cell, nothing will happen. So whenever we study viruses, we learn not just about the virus, but the host as well. We learn about cells. Uh, for example, we can learn about mosquito hosts, protists, and even humans and plants. We learn about the host. And so many discoveries in biology has, have been revealed by using viruses to probe hosts. Uh, very basic stuff like splicing. Splicing of genes was discovered in virus-infected cells and so many others. So when you study viruses, you're not just studying the virion, studying the virion, you're studying the infected cell. And you will learn about that as well. Now, uh, many, many textbooks and many of my colleagues, in fact, uh, use anthropomorphic analyses to teach virology. They talk about offense versus defense and armies of viruses and battles. This, is, this, in my view, is completely wrong because it assigns human qualities to viruses. Oh, the virus wants to do this. The virus thinks it's doing this, but it wants to do that. Those, those are the kinds of anthropomorphisms I'm talking about. Now, you may say, well, this is harmless. What, what's the, the, the harm done? But in fact, the way we reason, and we humans obviously reason in a certain way about outcomes and so forth, viruses don't do that. They have no reason. So there's no point in, in saying viruses ensure, employ, exhibit, or display anything. So we, in fact, in our textbook, try to purge it of all of these anthropomorphisms. And if you find one, let me know, because I think we got rid of them all. So the, the basic view here is that viruses evolve because they make lots of progeny, they're subject to selection, some win and some lose and that's it. The viruses that win are not happy, the viruses that lose are not sad, the viruses that win don't want to win, they have, they have no say in the matter whatsoever. Whatever the selective force is placed on them, that is what determines the outcome. So don't think of viruses as you would think of yourself or your brother or your sister or any, any human being. It just doesn't work. Uh, I wrote about this on the blog some time ago, and, and a virologist who I know in France said, yeah, but isn't it good to know, to think about viruses in human ways from time to time? It helps you clarify your thinking. No, it doesn't. It doesn't help you clarify your thinking because you're making human assumptions about what viruses can do. Okay, so this is one of my pet peeves, and um, I hope that you, you can avoid these as well. Now, how small are viruses? Obviously, they have to get in a cell, but I want you to have a sense of the size of viruses. So here's a slide that I think does that very nicely. Uh, here's E. coli. It's a big guy right here. And it has a bacteriophage attached to it. Uh, so these are quite large. Here is a virion. It's called tobacco mosaic virus. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, here's human immunodeficiency virus. So these are, this is uh, magnified 100,000 times. Now in this panel are a variety of molecules and even a virus. And um, here it is exploded, so you can see here's a carbon atom, uh, a tRNA, an antibody molecule, some ribosomes, and this is a virus. Here's, this is poliovirus, so it's quite small. You can see it's about the size of a ribosome. So there it is right there. So you see uh, some viruses are quite large, others are quite small. Here's some cellular molecules, myosin and actin, to give you an idea. So this is now magnified a million times. Of course, the answer to the age-old question 
how many viruses can you fit on the head of a pin? The answer is, well, if you're talking about the common cold virus, about 500 million. So every time you sneeze, you fire an aerosol that has a lot of virus particles. Every droplet that you make when you sneeze has about 20,000 virus particles in it. This is an actual um, head of a pin with various organisms on it to give you some example. This is a dust mite, I believe, right here. And over here in this box are where the viruses will be. Here it is magnified. Uh, these are red blood cells. Uh, I think this is a lymphocyte. This is a yeast cell, a pollen. And here the virus is all clumped up in here. These are various bacteria here. So the viruses are quite small compared to everything else. This is another view that helps you appreciate size. Here is a cell, a eukaryotic cell with a nucleus, of course. And there are two different viruses on its surface. One is herpes virus, shown here. You can see it quite clearly there. But then there's another smaller virus there, poliovirus. And that's the one that's about the size of ribosomes. So you see poliovirus is about 30 nanometers. That's not the smallest virus, but it, it's approaching the smallest virus. Herpes virus is 200 nanometers. The biggest viruses are about 800 nanometers in diameter. Here is uh, one of the biggest viruses that we know of. These are called Mimi viruses. You can see these in an infected cell by light microscopy. They are so big. Now, most viruses you need to use an electron microscope to visualize because they're so small. But Mimi viruses are about 750, 800 microns in nanometers in diameter. And you can see them. These are the Mimi virus particles right here. This happens to be an electron micrograph. but uh, you can see by the size of these particles that they would be visible in light microscopy. These Mimi viruses are very interesting. They were only discovered about four or five years ago. They were discovered in a cooling tower in France. And the, uh, it's believed that they infect amoeba in nature. But, but we're not quite sure about that. They've since been discovered in other environments as well. And they're quite large. You can see here uh, 400 nanometer capsid. And these fibers make it about 750 nanometers. Uh, yes, question? Uh, what are the consequences of size? Well, what are the consequences of size for viruses? Very interesting. So if you're very small, you can't have many genes. And you have to depend more on the cell. If you're large, like these Mimi viruses, you can have a lot of genes. The genome of Mimi's is 1.2 million base pairs. That's the biggest that we know of for viruses. And this encodes a lot of genes that aren't in any other virus. Uh, these, kind, these big DNA viruses encode their own DNA replication machinery. They even have uh, genes that uh, encode parts of the